Good morning. Thank you, ladies, for that uh, wonderful exhortation. Uh, you know, every time that uh, they do that song, just before I have to get up here and preach, uh, it's just such a revealer of the tension of Christianity, uh, because I, in one sense, uh, feel completely energized by the challenge to, to show Christ from the preaching of his word to glorify our Lord, and at the same time, I feel completely inadequate uh, for such a task. And, and I think that that's uh, how a man should, in some sense, enter the pulpit uh, in many ways. So thank you for that. Uh, last week, we had a wonderful time uh, honoring our mothers uh, and seeing an example of faithfulness given to us in the life of one of our Old Testament characters, uh, Hannah, the mother of Samuel, the prophet of God, who uh, God used to uh, sort of, uh, we know from the book of Acts, he was the first of the prophets, uh, not in the literal sense because we know Moses is named prior to him, but in the sense that we see much of the prophetic literature of Scripture uh, coming out of Samuel beginning that, as, as Peter rightly recognizes in Acts chapter 3. Uh, he was the anointer of kings. He ended the season, uh, the dispensation, so to speak, of the judges. He was the last of them. And then we have Saul and David and into the era of the kings. And so this uh, mighty man of God, and we saw the beginning of that, uh, in the prayer life and the uh, pursuit of his mother, Hannah. So wonderful uh, week last week to recognize uh, those needs. And coming out of that, uh, especially, uh, I am excited especially, uh, to continue this morning in our study of Jesus' pattern for our prayers in Matthew 6, uh, seeing, as we've been seeing, the fundamental need we have from prayer, or for prayer as a gift from God that enables us to be molded to the image of his son and to accomplish his purposes in this life. Uh, I was sharing with our elders uh, Friday night in our meeting and again this morning how convinced I am more than ever before of the fundamental foundational uh, reality of Christianity that is so often overlooked. Uh, in other words, to just share in transparency how wrong we get the basics. And guys, when we get the basics wrong, uh, it doesn't bode well for everything beyond that. Uh, and so excited for our study in, in, in Matthew, uh, walking through this recognition, this understanding, and this pattern of prayer that he's given us, that it might shape our life, that it's a gift. Uh, but more than that, that it's a tool that our Lord has given us to use in our sanctification, in the work of conforming us to the image of his Son, in the work of preparing us for heaven, in the work of using us in our life that we have here. And it is so misunderstood today, this fundamental gift of prayer. A quote from Pastor J.I. Packer uh, kind of sums it up. He says, The prayer of a Christian is not an attempt to force God's hand. And how often do we see that? However, he says this, But it is a humble acknowledgement of their helplessness and dependence. And how rarely... Do we see that? That's a great quote, uh, and it really ties it in well with what we're going to be studying this morning. As you turn to chapter 6, uh, I want to read together Christ's commands uh, for concerning our pattern of prayer together. Uh, and in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, our Lord says to us this, Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And just a quick recap of where we are. Uh, we saw him rebuking uh, sin creeping into our prayer. Uh, it, through verse 8, and then we get to this, and we see in this pattern where Christ says, pray then in this way, and gives us this very clear pattern. He begins with our Father, uh, which is the depiction of intimacy through the salvation that we have with our Father in heaven, the peace that Romans 5 describes him bringing to us in our salvation, and it reminds us uh, of the relationship that we would be able to go to the God of this universe and, and, and call him our Father, uh, the relationship, but also the cost. And what that should do within us, this pattern being invoked, should, should make us both bold and worshipful. 
all at the same time, recognizing that we in our prayer life are coming to our Father. Then we see that it says in heaven, recognizing that he is clearly distinguishing himself from our earthly examples and any shortcomings that they may have shown us. He is our heavenly Father. Our earthly fathers are in a sense a mere shadow of, of what he truly is, and we need to be reminded of that for the boldness and the different aspects of prayer, the confidence that we have in him. And then in that next part of that verse, he says, Hallowed be thy name. Now we know very clearly that we do not make God holy, that we are not in any sense adding to his holiness or anything else. But what it does do is it reminds us of who we are talking to, that we are speaking to our holy creator father our holy creator god in every aspect of his character and that it might temper our prayers rightly he goes on and he says this pray then in this pattern thy kingdom come ultimately being a reminder for us of the the desire the urgent desire that we as believers should have for the fulfillment of his kingdom that we are those who long for his return for the fulfillment of righteousness he says thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven this is a reminder to us in the midst of it that, that his kingdom is not yet here in its fullness, that there's still yet to be done, and that we are his means for it compelling us forward in our lives, that we are his chosen instrument for carrying out, showing his glory to a needy world. And then we come to this section in verse 11, and it's a very simple statement. It's one that we've probably all heard. Uh, even unbelievers have heard this and would recognize it. And it's this statement, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. What a, what a simple statement. Uh, and yet, I think we miss so much about this when we don't take the time to think through. Several uh, modern commentators note that this is a seemingly distant re prayer request for us today. This is, we live in a land of wealth and comparative ease and, and, and plenty. As a matter of fact, as I've shared with you, that my wife wants me to be on a different lifestyle, uh, meaning that I don't get to eat all the things I want to eat. Uh, it's almost as though the prayers become the opposite. Lord, give me less of my daily bread in this time. And, and that's kind of the, the mindset of us here in America to a degree, is it not? I mean, it, it, it's all there, and we're going to look at that. However, what I would say to you is this. This prayer pattern... Uh, recognizing this, uh, even as we struggle maybe to pray this in our time of plenty, there is so much amazing truth for us, to, our spirits, to feast upon. It's such an essential aspect of who we are. Because I want to be clear, if for some reason you don't have daily bread tomorrow, you will desperately need it. It is desperate, it is a desperate need of every human being. Whether it's being provided or whether it's there or not, it still exists. And we miss that. And more than that, when we look just at this pattern, we're, we're coming into this time of petition, uh, and it is utterly amazing in its completion. This, this simple prayer that many of us probably have heard for years, uh, it is such a display of our Lord's perfection. And we come to this three petitions that are to be our pattern, I've been just in awe as studying through this and going to depth, uh, in awe and also in repentance uh, of the all-encompassing majesty that is contained in this simple prayer that we take for granted. Uh, I shared again with our elders just this morning that when we miss the basics, to, to give you an example, when, when you fire a gun at a target, if you're a quarter inch off at the gun barrel, you're a mile off at the end of the target. It, it, that's the nature of this. So when we begin with the foundational error as it pertains to our prayer, and I say that to say this, we sure have missed this one. I can't point to one that I think stands out more uh, at this point uh, in our Christian lives here in America than missing the beauty and majesty and necessity of what this simple statement is giving us in our Lord's pattern for prayer. Consider this, though, just to see the all-encompassing of it. These are from several commentators over... Uh, a great deal of time, spanning several hundred years. Just listen to one uh, who, who brings up the all-encompassing nature of, of these petitions. He says this, first of all, give us this day our daily bread speaks of our physical life. He says, secondly, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors speaks of our mental life. And thirdly, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil speaks to our spiritual life. Bread addresses our physical. Forgiveness is what frees our mind from the anxiety and the pain of guilt and the burden of sin. 
and leading us and directing us from away from evil is the spiritual direction of our growth and maturity. He goes on and he mentions this. He says, by the way, bread takes care of the present, forgiveness takes care of the past, and help takes care of the future. And so what a, what a picture that all the dimensions of life are covered and all the needs of life are covered. And he closes with this. It's amazing. The marvel, the wonder of how God's infinite mind can reduce all there is of human need to three simple, profound statements. That's what we have in this section. And so we should come to it rightly. We should come to it with the mind of, Lord, how am I not doing what your word has given me so that we might then become doers of his word? Think of it in this way. Our all-wise Heavenly Father gives us this small and simple pattern for our prayers. And even in its short wording in our verse today, the petition we'll look at, we still see two major components presented and affected with many rich implications flowing out of both. In this verse, give us this day our daily bread. We're going to see this morning just how much is packed into that and the implications it brings forth for us in our life. The first implication or the first area that it's affecting is our physical care. Our physical care. Uh, that's very clear in this uh, petition, this request, this, this go before the Lord and, and, and ask Him for your physical needs of, of bread on a daily basis. And, and I consider that, and this is something that, that so many times people try and overthink aspects of Scripture. I think that there are certain times, yes, this is a pattern for prayer. Yes, this is something that we need to be practicing. Yes, it is practical in all of those things. But I also believe that there's a, a, a very specific element where this is just calling us to come and worship our Father. And I think that happens a lot in Scripture, that, that we miss trying to overthink or, or, or figure out to a degree that is, it robs us of this one very simple element that much of this is calling us to awe, wonder, and worship. And I believe that's what we see this morning because, think about this, uh, that our Heavenly Father, our omnipotent, omnipresent Heavenly Father, who is perfect and holy in all things, cares perfectly for my situation. He, he doesn't need anything for me to accomplish his purposes or to fulfill his promises. And yet he allows me to participate. And more than that, he even desires my participation. He doesn't need it. He desires it to be through relationship to him. This is the first implication of our first petition, that prayer keeps us in touch or in contact with God. That's an essential part of being a believer, wouldn't you say? That you have a relationship with God? Isn't that an essential element? We throw that out so, re so, so cavalierly at times. I hear people say all the time, well, it's not about religion, it's about a relationship. Well, what does that mean? Oh, I don't know. That's just what I've always heard. Hey, well, how does that play itself out? What's that relationship look like? Well, you, you know, I mean, he, he's my friend now. Okay, I get the t-shirt. But what does the Bible say? And it's so important for us to understand this, that, that prayer is a tool that keeps our relationship constant and in contact with our God. Try having a relationship with someone that you're not in contact with. It doesn't work. The relationship breaks down. And so let me try and explain more fully what I mean. We're going to be in, in quite a few places in Scripture. But let's begin with just establishing a few biblical truths with clarity. Number one, and you might agree with this, but we're going to look at it more fully. God already knows our needs. He already knows. When you go to him in prayer, we need to be reminded of this. We're not telling him something he doesn't know. More than that, he has already promised to meet those needs, even their physical, temporary needs. But in that truth, he desires our communication with him, because we are his children in relationship with him. We're going to get to it soon, but let's just read it now. Just jump ahead in chapter 6. I just want to look at verses 26 down to 31. 26 down to 31, Christ is, is heading there. He's laying the foundation for this and what we're even seeing this morning. And he says this, Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? Man, that's a, that's a great and rich truth for us. 
he goes on and he says, And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? And so he goes on in verse 32 at the second half. He says, For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. In other words, let's be clear. Our sovereign God already knows your needs. And more than that, he's already promised to provide for them. That's already established. We also recognize, again, in this section, that prayer is a gift for his citizens. We, we talked about that at the beginning with the terminology of our Father, that prayer is for his children. It is not for unbelievers. And so all the time people say things, and I see it, prayer is going up for you. I'll see it posted on Facebook when someone's going through a trial. It's sending up prayers for you. Well, there's no possible prayer that an unbeliever can send up on behalf of someone else. The only and first prayer that God hears from an unbeliever is a prayer of repentance and faith. It is that recognition of, of humbling themselves before Him and seeking Him in His salvation. And so this is again carried out. Christ makes this clear in the contrast He gives in verses 32 and 33 where we just read. He says, look, here's the difference. You shouldn't worry about these things, the clothing or, or the food or the needs. Now the Gentiles, which is terminology in Christ and in Scripture for, for those who are unbelievers, for pagans, for those outside of God's covenant. This is in, when Christ is preaching. For the Gentiles or for, for the pagans eagerly seek all of these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Just, just look with me on the screen. We're going to go through a couple other verses that affirm this truth. That prayer and promises and the provision of God are for his children, oftentimes specifically. Now we have uh, what, what we would recognize as, as uh, general uh, grace or, or uh, the grace that he gives to all. And in that, we all breathe the same air. Sometimes, even the wicked will prosper in areas around us. And we were given that in Scripture. But, but understand that God has not bound himself to promises that will make provision for those who are not his children. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 3, it says, The Lord will not allow the righteous to hunger, but he will reject the craving of the wicked. Proverbs 13, 25, it says the righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the stomach of the wicked is in need. Now we've learned through the Beatitudes who are the righteous ones. Those who have received Christ's righteousness as a gift. This is the picture throughout Scripture. And so understand this, those who are in Christ are those whom God has bound himself to in promises of provision. David tells this uh, same account as, as he recognizes his faithfulness in Psalm 37. It's one of my favorite psalms because it's David just, just recognizing that we're not to be envious when the wicked prosper. And he goes forth and says, and here's one of the accounts that I've seen in my own life. Listen to verses 23 to 26. David says this in Psalm 37, The steps of a man are established by the Lord. And he delights in his way. When he falls, he will not be hurled headlong, because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. I have been young, and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, or his descendants begging bread. All day long he is gracious and lends, and his descendants are a blessing. And so we see clearly from Scripture that God is faithful to meet the needs of his children. And we believe, as it tells us clearly in Scripture, that he already knows those needs, that we're not giving him intimate or special or, or any knowledge he doesn't already have in our prayer life. And he has not bound himself to meet the needs of all, but he has promised to meet the needs of those who are his, which, by the way, is the group that is commanded to pray in this way, as we saw earlier. So in the middle of this prayer, we have all of this being unfolded for us. Now, there's a, an argument that comes up oftentimes in this. It was actually brought up in my members class today, and I promised that it would be addressed. Um, and so I want you to hear this, because some would say, well, wait a second. God doesn't always meet the needs. 
Because there are those who literally die from hunger and from other treatable afflictions. And, and while we recognize, okay, maybe they're not his children, but there are those who are his children. You see, Christians die. Christians die from, from everything that non-Christians die from. We're faced with those same things. But there's a very specific biblical understanding that affects this. And, and I just want you to listen there. Pastor John MacArthur gave an answer to this that I think sums it up well. And so I just want to, I want to read this to you. And he says this, if you're familiar with Matthew 18, uh, there's a passage in there where it says that, that for the children, little children, their angels do constantly watch over them. And he says th this recognition of, of God's sovereign promise and provision not happening at times in someone's life, even to the point of death where his righteous one would die. He says this, it's very much like Matthew 18, where it talks about little children, and it says their angels do constantly watch over them. And then the question often comes, well, what about when a child dies? Does that mean that the angel was asleep on the job? No. The angel only fulfills his function until the sovereignty of God deems that that life should end. And so we see the fullness of God's character in this. He goes on, he says, you see, in other words, God says, and this is his quote, God says, MacArthur, you have so much time in my sovereign plan, and you're called to a task. Now, if you will set your heart and your mind on my kingdom and my righteousness and the things above, I will meet your physical needs. And he goes on to say, and I believe that with all my heart, so that the preoccupation in my life is not the physical. And I also know that when the Lord sees fit to remove what those needs are, understand this from God's word. God takes care of the physical until such a time as the physical life ends. And then we enter into an abundance that's inconceivable. And this is what we need to recognize. God is not slack. These things that we look around and judge God according to what our perception is should never be. And this is such a clear picture. God promises to meet the needs of his people, and he is faithful to do so. Continuing forward, just recognizing that, Paul addresses God's provision in Philippians 4 where he says this, after addressing his own season of affliction and need to the church and saying that he's learned how to, how to be content and no matter the circumstance, he then thanks them for their help to him with these words in verse 19. And my God will supply all of your needs. And here's the, here's the interesting thing. Listen to the, to the reference, so to speak, to the bank account that he draws from. According to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. In the book of Job, when he addresses Job in the whirlwind, he tells Job how he feeds the animals, how he cares for the needs, how the ravens, when their babies are hatched, cry out from the nest, and it is God who makes provision for them. What an amazing picture. We see him raising up Joseph in the book of Genesis through much suffering and trial, and he did so in order that his people would be cared for in the time of famine that was coming. Joseph himself recognizes that in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. And on and on this goes throughout the pages of Scripture. We can see that. We see he sent the ravens to bring food for Elijah. He did not let the widow's oil and grain run out in the season of drought and famine. We could go on recognizing the faithful promise and provision of our God for our physical needs, but I just want to say this. It is clear from Scripture that our God knows our needs. It is clear from Scripture that he has already promised to meet those needs. And it is also equally clear from Scripture that he calls us to ask anyway. Those are the realities that we can clearly see. And what a beautiful picture of our relationship with our Heavenly Father. You know, there's a wonderful example in this church. He's probably going to be mad at me for sharing it, but it stands out to me. Every Wednesday night, if you're here on Wednesday night, Brother Phil Lowe, in his prayer, before we begin the message, praise for Israel, for God's protection and provision over Israel. And I remember thinking at one point, you know, God has a plan for Israel. We know that. His word tells us that. More than that, my God has promised to carry out that plan, and I have absolutely no doubt that he will do just that. But what I've come to realize is that Brother Phil is a faithful reminder to me
that I should be burdened about God's plans, that they should be on my mind, and that His purposes should be continually before me, that I would pursue after them in such a way that I would continually go to Him about them. What an amazing picture of faithfulness that God has given us, that we might go to Him. It's such an amazing thing that our omnipotent, omnipresent God says, come to me. This is the first implication of this. The outcome of this petition is that it keeps his children in touch and in contact with him. That's important to our relationship, and it's what we take for granted. When we are not going to him for our daily needs, we lose that contact, we lose that communication, we lose that touch. And so this is the first implication. The second one is us asking for our daily needs in this pattern for prayer is it reminds us, it renders us thankful to Him. Have you ever thought about what Scripture says about our thankfulness to God? It renders us thankful to Him. And, and going to Him, even if your refrigerator is full, and going to Him still recognizing that He is the provider of all, and that you need Him for the daily bread, whether you've got a McDonald's on your corner, a Publix up the street, it doesn't matter. It's still this reminder of our thankfulness unto Him. It's so easy to stop being thankful to the source, isn't it? I mean, it happens like that. I find it in my own life. And you know, I read the pages of Scripture and I see this. I see, for example, and I ask myself this question about Adam and Eve, for example. How on earth did, did Satan get them? And then I think, you know, it's a good thing Philip wasn't there. He'd have got himself before Satan ever arrived. That's the reality of who we are. I think in terms of, of Israel. And I think to myself, now, now picture this. God himself brings them out of Egypt. He parts the Red Sea. He destroys Pharaoh's army. He's visibly manifested to them in a multitude of ways, from a, a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud during the day. He's feeding them miraculously through manna and quail and other things. And at the moment that he is visibly manifesting himself, upon the mountain to Moses, what do the people do? Man, that's really cool. Hey, can you build us a golden calf? Because we want to bow down and worship that. And I think to myself, really? <laughs> really? I look at these things and I think, my goodness, they were really dumb. And then I have to think, wait a second, Philip. How many times has God, when you look backwards, can you see him faithfully providing fulfilling, answering, doing all of those things, and yet in the moment of the present worry, you're prone to say, I got to go do something, even something contrary to him. How many times do I forget my thankfulness? When's the last time that you thank God for your salvation? Now, if it's been in the last six months, it's probably still pretty fresh on your mind. But I'll tell you something, if it's five years, ten, some of you, 50 years, more, it can get to be a distant arena of thankfulness and the most magnificent gift we're given. That's why I love communion this evening where we're going to be reminded of that gift in our time together. And so it's easy to stop being thankful to the source, isn't it? It's a sad indictment, but it's also a very dangerous one. I don't know if you realize that in Romans chapter 1. If you want to turn there uh, just quickly, in Romans chapter 1, I want you to see this as we're talking about the wrath of God abiding on the unrighteousness of men who suppress his truth in their unrighteousness. And then it goes into this account of, of how those things are, are being done and how that wrath is being shown and God turning the people over uh, to their own sinful desires. But right in the middle of all that, and I'm just going to read a small section in verses 21 and 22 uh, of Romans chapter 1. One of the things that we see is this in verse 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God, nor give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And in the full context of that, you can see that played out. But what I want us to recognize is very clearly there is a direct correlation between our thankfulness and our faithfulness. There's no way to miss that implication from God's Word. That when we become a thankless people, we become a people who are not pursuing God. We become a people who are pursuing ourselves. We become arrogant. We say, give us this day our daily bread, 
I worked hard this week and went to Publix, and I don't need God to provide that. I'll never forget the account, and I don't remember who it was. I've heard Norm and John share it of a missionary that came many years ago. And his first comment was, I, you guys, being a Christian is hard in America. And this man came from a, from a country where, where life was hard. And, and his response to that was, you don't need God, you have Publix. He, he said it with a very heavy accent. Uh, but that was his recognition. He said, in my country, uh, prayers for our daily bread are a constant necessity that tie us to God. Here in America, they can be lost very easily. And so there's this recognition of, of asking him. Even if that provision is there, it causes us to be thankful for his provision. And it's a direct correlation between our thankfulness and our faithfulness. More than that, we see throughout Scripture, Paul himself exhorting us uh, to give thanks in all things. First Thess 5, 18, he says this, in, in everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. You know, it's so easy for us to get caught up in, in the bad, isn't it? I'm reminded of this so many times, I think this week, of, of a situation where, where Eric Nelson had to have emergency surgery for a bacteria that came in through a blister, and we think, woe is Eric. And then I think, you know, how lucky is Eric? This wasn't 100 years ago. We'd have cut his hand off, right? There's so much provision the Lord's giving that we, that we miss. We, we get so focused on, on the bad and, and those things. But Paul says, in everything, give thanks. And then more than that, he says, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And so if you want to know what God's will is and then do it, it's to be thankful, to give thanks for everything. And this petition in the pattern of prayer that we're to follow is something that brings our thankfulness to the forefront every day in every way. Being reminded of our needs and being reminded of his provision through prayer triggers our thanksgiving. And more than that, it reminds us of another very important truth in Scripture, that all aspects of our lives are an opportunity given which is intended to bring glory to Him and to His name. 1 Corinthians 10.31, in that chapter that, that just reminds us, look at Israel and their mistakes and don't repeat them. Hey, that's the very simple pattern that we see in 1 Corinthians 10. He says, consider the account of Israel that we have in our Old Testament and see how God's children, how God's people turn from him in a multitude of ways and don't repeat that pattern. And in verse 31, he says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, that's a very all-encompassing statement. He starts with the necessities, the daily necessities, eating and drinking, and then he goes from that to saying, by the way, not just the foundational basic things that we do every day, but whatever you do, this is how you're to do it to his glory. And so we see in this very simple petition of Matthew chapter 6 and in verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, the simple petition for our, our physical needs, a wonderful reminder of our God's enduring faithfulness. More than that, this is uh, a tool given to us that according to this pattern, it will, it will tether us. Uh, we sing a song where it says, prone to wonder. Lord, I know it. Prone to leave the God I love. Hey, tether me to yourself. Well, here he does that. He gives us this pattern for prayer that ties us to his faithfulness, that ties us to his character, that accomplishes his purposes of, of us being humble, that accomplishes his purposes of us being dependent, that accomplishes his purposes of, of us being in relationship and dependency upon him. It keeps us thankful to him in all things, big or small, seemingly needed or not, and it reminds us of the opportunities that daily we have in every arena to glorify Him. And that's just the physical care side of this first petition. Let's take a minute now and look at the spiritual care that is accomplished in this very simple petition from our Lord that, that I'm afraid we again take for granted. Because, again, we live in the land of plenty. We, we live in a time where to ask God for our, our daily needs is pretty much non-existent unless there's a daily need that we really feel is important, which generally is a daily want, which James says when you ask in those ways, you're not going to receive anyhow because you're asking to fulfill your desires. And so we've got this broken picture of prayer. The fundamental foundational thing that we're given by God, and we do it 
so poorly, so wrongly. Again, I've, I've been very convicted in my own life and in the life of this church to, to have this picture rightly and more than having this picture rightly, to then do it. It does us no good to have a beautiful picture and do nothing with it. Here's the spiritual care of give us this day our, our daily bread. And again, the problem in most of our situations is the neglect of this as a regular pattern of prayer. And again, think about it in this way. I don't think we do it on purpose, but maybe it's subconsciously. My refrigerator is full. Check and move on. I don't, I don't need to ask God for my daily provision. I went grocery shopping yesterday. And that's not a measure of what I need to do. We see this in Israel and some of their, their patterns of prayer. We looked at this at the beginning where they have all of these uh, patterns of prayer that they had, were obligated to carry out in the morning and in the evening and when they greeted one another and in this time. And in one of those patterns of prayer, as they petitioned God for their food, it was a petition for their annual harvest. Lord, give us this year the harvest that we need. And so I believe that God in his infinite, all-knowing wisdom is addressing things then and things ongoing today. I think I would say this to you. I believe, having studied this and examined my own life, that this section of giving us this day, this petition of giving us this day our daily bread, has significance which is specific to us in our times of plenty, even more so than those in their times of need. When someone's in need, they don't have to be reminded to ask God. That's a pattern that's just happening. That pattern's taken care of. If there's a need, if they recognize a need in their life, they don't have to be reminded to pray then in this way. They're doing it. I believe this is very specifically regarding us in our time of plenty, as a warning, a reminder, a tool to tether us to our relationship to God as we saw earlier. It is easy, so easy, for us to become unfaithful because we forget our daily dependence upon Him. Our God loves us and He desires relationship with us as His children, but as a faithful father, He also demands faithfulness from us. And He is perfectly all-knowing and he, in his infinite wisdom, knows how easily we stray from him in our times of plenty. And so he's given us this tool, I believe, for us specifically in our times of plenty. This pattern for our prayers keeps us tethered to the truth of our dependence in such a way that keeps us faithful to him. Consider a few examples. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 31. And as you're turning there, I'll just remind us quickly of, of the example that leads up to this. This is Moses uh, being addressed by God and then going forth. And what we know is the song of Moses comes out of this address. Uh, in Exodus 16, we, we are told uh, of the account of the Israelites being led out uh, by God himself through his instrument, Moses. And, and it's interesting because God recognizes uh, the need for dependence upon him as part of our faithfulness. And so in that, how did God provide for his people's needs of food? Well, we know that in their clothing, it was amazing. Their clothing didn't wear out for 40 years. Not even their sandals. For 40 years, God miraculously made provision for the, for the needs that they had. But the way he met that need, as it pertained to their food, is he sent manna. Every morning there was manna, and he gave them very specific commands. He said, do not gather more than what is necessary for the day, except from the day before the Sabbath, gather enough for two days so that you won't violate the Sabbath on that day. And more than that, when people did not, by faith, follow his commands, he sent maggots that ate the manna that they'd gathered in surplus. And so it was of no value to them anyhow. And so when they disobeyed, he handled that. And here he explains that much of this comes from him recognizing as our sovereign father the tendencies of man's heart. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, look with me at verse 20. When he's addressing Moses and how Moses needs to exhort and warn the people. And this is what he says, For when I bring them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to their fathers, and they have eaten and are satisfied and become prosperous, then they will turn to other gods and serve them. And they will spurn me and break my covenant. You see, I believe there's a whole lot more happening in verse 11 of Matthew 6 when you understand the fullness of our Heavenly Father and of our own sinful tendencies. You see, when God's people are satisfied and prosperous, their natural tendency was 
and is to forget the one who has given it to them. And we face that. We face that in our own lives. If you're honest this morning, you can look in your own life and see how easily that creeps in. And this picture is so clear. Turn with me to 32. Moses recognized this reality as God himself had given it. Obviously, he recognized it. But he then warned Israel, speaking to them in 32 and verse 15, and saying, this is what's going to happen. But Jeshurun, which is, is a word for Israel and their faithfulness. When, when they're faithful, this was a terminology that described that. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You are grown fat, thick, and sleek. Then he forsook God who made him, made him and he scorned the rock of his salvation. You know, th this is such a reality in our lives, is it not? Can we not look around and see this being carried out? Now, can we not look inwardly? And again, I ask you this, when is the last time that when you weren't in need, you were following this pattern of prayer of recognizing your need? When was the last time that you were, you were faithful to recognize the dangers of what happens when we in prosperity and provision, what creeps in? In Israel's life, as an example, Christ himself warns against it in Matthew 6, a little bit further where we looked. How quickly does it creep in to our lives? And this is speaking to us as God's children. Remember, this prayer is for God's children. This reality prompted another Old Testament saint. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. There's another uh, Old Testament saint. We probably, he's not a well-known name. Uh, his name is Agar, son of Jacob. Agar, son of Jacob. Uh, probably most of you have never heard that name. Uh, it's attributed to him. In Proverbs chapter 30, much of what's written there is attributed to him. And so I just want to read a section in that where he, in recognition of how easily this creeps in, prayed a prayer that I, I don't think you'll find this fitting in the American dream. Hey, this prayer doesn't really fit in the American success story. Hey, this prayer really doesn't fit in, in our households. This prayer really doesn't fit in our government. This prayer doesn't fit in our model. This prayer doesn't fit in our lives. But I want you to hear him pray it. And I want you to hear this prayer through the lens of, of what we just read. And, and I would say this. Remember our God takes an eternal view. Our God sees the end from the beginning. And so when he looks at our lives, not only does he care about the moments and our daily needs, he cares about our eternal condition as well. And, and it's important for us to have that mindset, to have his mind and apply it to our life. Because if not, we become so concerned about the temporal, physical things that we forsake the eternal. That's the pattern that Israel had. That's the pattern that we see God warning about, that Moses warning about, and we see them, in fact, carrying out. That when they became prosperous, when they weren't under the threat of imminent doom, they turned from the Lord. They worshipped other gods. They did what was right in their own eyes. But when there was this absolute need, then they would turn back to the Lord, and the Lord was faithful to answer them. Brothers and sisters, how good would it be to avoid that desperate need by simply going to the Lord daily, by simply following this pattern. Listen to the words of Agur in Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 and 9. Two things I asked of you. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, so that I will not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. You see, I believe that the pattern of prayer that we have in, in Matthew 6, beginning with this, this first petition, well, beginning with uh, our Father, is a pattern which tethers us to what he has given us. It tethers us to his purposes and plans. It conforms us to the image of his son. It is an absolute gift and a tool that he has given us. And, and the question I have for you is, is do you, like Agar, see your spiritual as more valuable than your physical? Are you willing to forsake 
successes and pursuits if they become a fetter and a hindrance to your spiritual life? Are you willing to pray in such a way that brings this reality to bear by our sovereign, omnipotent God? When you hear this prayer of Agar where he says, give me neither poverty nor riches, are you content for your spiritual life to be protected, to live with that reality? And I've got to be honest with you. Here in America, it's not as though I look around and see a whole lot of starvation happening here in this congregation. We are taken care of. Our needs are being met. And yet contentment, here in America, it is at an all-time low. We are never content. I, I hear complaining. And I'm indicting myself, just to be clear. This isn't pointing at any of you, but you're the group gathered here, so you get to hear it this morning. This is the reality that we face. There is no contentment. And what we're doing, if we truly believe the fullness of Scripture, is we're indicting God. And we're saying, well, I know that you are sovereign. I know that you see the end from the beginning. I know all of these things, and in light of that, you've sure messed things up. You've sure made a mess of this, because I can't be content with your provision for me. Now, this is not an excuse to continue in sin. This is not a, hey... I like being lazy and God's going to make provision for me. This is not a picture of that. There's never a picture of that in Scripture. There's indictments continually uh, against that reality. This is not a picture of, well, I just want to live in a certain way and, and, and God needs to recognize that. Uh, oftentimes I hear that in prayer. One of the most amazing and sad things about prayer is that I hear people oftentimes, and, and I've even heard it at times from within, within church, where people will, will become angry with God for his lack of carrying out their purposes. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. I, I want you to think about that for just a moment. What you have done, if that is a reality, is you are shaking your fist at God and you're saying, how dare you, God, not use your power on behalf of Almighty me? Now, I know you would never word it that way, but that's what you're saying. How dare you, God, not use your power to heal, to provide, to give what I believe is necessary for this. And, and that's the reality that I see us being faced with in, in the pattern that we pray or the lack of pattern uh, that I oftentimes experience in my own life. I experience in my own life a, a prayer life that at times can be rushed. And, and I want to be clear in this. Interestingly enough, when you look in the Psalms, you oftentimes don't see this exact pattern. Hey, oftentimes it begins with, where are you? I'm in a lot of trouble and things are going to go really bad unless you show up. Where are you? Right? I mean, that's the picture that you oftentimes see in the Psalms. And, and there's a specific purpose and reason in that. And I, I want to be clear in this. There are seasons where, where, listen, if you see a need such as the one that always comes up if a child's in the road, you don't need to kneel and, and bring petitions before the Lord and say, go get the kid out of the road. And that's what you see happening in the Psalms. These were God's children who had been made specific promises and provision from him. And they're simply recognizing that in the moment of... Uh, the king of the Philistines seizing them and, and going to cut their head off. And they're saying, oh Lord, <laughs> if you don't show up, this is how it's going to go. Where are I? But then you see them coming back around and fulfilling the rest of the petition somewhere in the midst of that. Uh, somewhere in the midst of that, they're recognizing God's holiness. They're recognizing God's provision. They're recognizing all of those things. And so I want to be clear, this is not something that every single moment of your prayer life is going to look like this. However, if this is not a daily normative pattern for you to be going to the Lord in prayer, you will be robbing yourself of his provision and promise and tools and gifts for you to accomplish and be the purpose he's given you. And so recognizing that, do you see your spiritual as more valuable than your physical? You should. I'll tell you why. Uh, you know this, but you, maybe you need to hear it. One's eternal. The other's temporal. Your physicals, it's temporal. Amen. It's not going to last. We're told that, that, that bodily, bodily uh, discipline uh, is of some value. But spiritual, how much more? Because it's eternal. Our spiritual is eternal. And so when we forsake the spiritual in light of the temporal, 
How foolish is that? And I don't, none of us here are fools. And none of, we're, we're prone to it at times, need to be reminded of it, need to recognize it, turn from it. That's what Scripture is intended to do. And I pray that this morning that we see that. And I would say this to you, if you find yourself more caught up with the temporal, if you find yourself offended by the eternal, then I would caution you today, do not presume upon God's provision and faithfulness. Do not look at what you have before you and say, therefore, I don't need to ask and recognize his daily provision. Pray in this way, that it might guard your heart from temptation, that it might be a continual reminder of our utter dependency upon God every day, and thus recognizing that this is a tool that is a spiritual safeguard, caregiver, in our life. So, someone arrogantly said to me recently that they believe they had the greater faith because they don't have to pray, but instead trust God and has already given promises. It's a wrong view of prayer. It is an absolute misunderstanding of what God is. It is not just about petitioning our God for, for our needs but is rather about conforming us to his desires. Even as our faith is enlarged and tethered by faithfully praying in this pattern. One pastor addresses the argument that daily prayer for daily needs is a sign of anxiety. I couldn't believe that one. People said, well, well it seems like Jesus is contradicting what he says a little bit later in, in Matthew 6, that our Father knows these things and therefore we shouldn't be anxious about them. But if I'm thinking about them every day, I'm going to be anxious about them. Our, this pastor addresses it, and he says this, proper prayer is the antithesis and corrective to anxiety. Picture this, anxiety wrings its hands, faith folds its hands. Anxiety paces the floor, faith kneels on the floor. Prayer is an exercise in faith. It is not a display of anxiety. And so as we finish out this section, I, I would just commend you to this verse. What a rich little verse we have been given by our gracious and faithful Lord. And I would exhort us, brothers and sisters, let us, let us utilize the tools that we are given for the day ahead. Because these tools activate our faith and they reveal his faithfulness. What a grace. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, even as we recognize how quickly we stray from you, Lord. I pray that this morning would be a time of correction, that it would be a time of, of recognition, Lord, who you are, the gifts that you give us, that we would, Lord, even as we are thankful for the blessings of food and, and provision and, and the promises you've given, but Lord, let us, let us not forgo our spiritual care and being reminded to come to you in recognition of that need, in recognition of your provision, in communication and contact with you, Lord, and in thankfulness to the provision you have given us. Lord, being reminded of our utter dependence on you that, that truly we are but one calamity uh, away from, from that being a, a prayer of desperation. Lord, we cannot go without bread for very long. And Lord, even as you have been faithful to provide to us here in this room, here in America, Lord, I pray that we would be reminded that that provision is still from you and that we need you. Lord, I thank you for the patterns you've given us of prayer. Lord, I thank you for the fullness of, of the opportunity to pray for you. Lord, I pray that we would be more conformed to your uh, purpose and plan, to the image of your Son through our prayer lives. Lord, I pray that we would grow in diligence and pursuit through our prayer life. Lord, I thank you for this church, for the, the body of Christ that you have given us that we might gather together to serve you. And Lord, we ask for your strength and Lord, for your provision for the day ahead while trusting in your faithfulness and promise for whatever it holds. We ask this this morning in Christ's name. Amen.